Good evening, everyone. If I haven't met you before, my name is Willem van der Post, and I'm the chairman of Simple Capital, co-founder with some of my other colleagues that are online. And welcome to this, the third episode in our first series of Fireside Chats. Uh, we've got a couple of housekeeping rules that I'll slowly work through while we just wait for the last couple of logins, people to typically drop off the last WhatsApp call or email that they're doing and tuning into this episode. Um, and, uh, and we'll just quickly talk about housekeeping in, in our next slide while we give everyone that last minute to settle down. And hopefully, if you're in evening time or late afternoon, wherever you are in the world, grab that glass of wine and sit back for what hopes to be a interesting chat around democratization of video and how the world has changed in this pandemic. Uh, Tim, if I could just ask you to go to the next one while we buy a minute or two for people to either grab that glass of wine or the mimosa if you're having breakfast, depending on your time zone. Tonight's episode, we won't keep you longer than an hour. We know that time is a commodity and um, we respect your time. So we'll, we'll promptly end within an hour. During our episode, please have a look at the Q&A capability of Zoom. There is a button, depending on if you're an iPad or a browser or a smartphone. Uh, and if you click on that Q&A button, you'll be able to pose questions to our panel either during the conversation that we have with Steph or when we have the actual panel session. And so please feel free to use that if you wanna go right ahead today, right now. In fact, uh, log in to that Q&A part and pose a couple of test questions. We're happy to, to, to see you trial and error. Um, and then as you'll come to know, if you're not already a part of the Simple Capital community, feel free to join our community it is the way through which you are able to access some of our technology deal flow and also be included in some of those investment opportunities. And at the same time, where you're able to log in and find pertinent information in the exciting world of early stage technology companies. And we'll show you a QR code during the course of this episode that you can hover your camera over or copy the link from, and then make sure that you join that community. All right, so that's about two, two and a half minutes or so. Um, hopefully you're seated now, you're uh, nice and comfortable. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about what capital, uh, Simple Capital is and, and, and how we go about our business on the next slide. So we've tried to put this into depictions because I think everyone's got Zoom and you know webinar fatigue. So we try to make this a little bit more visual and interactive. And so from the left, the purpose of Simple Capital is to democratize early stage exponential growth opportunities. And we do that in a basketed fashion and shrunk ticket size fashion. So what I mean by that democratize is we allow and help people get access to early stage deal flow. We know that not everyone with um, uh, every walk of life has access to these early stage technology investment opportunities. And so part of our value proposition is that we bring you access to those opportunities. Early stage, we're not a private equity firm. We are a VC, so venture capital, which means that we get involved in helping those businesses scale from their inception to helping them grow very large. Um, and, and our stage of involvement is, is earlier rather than later. Of course, that's what unlocks the massive growth potential of our portfolio. When we talk about the third icon, the exponential growth, we look for companies that can scale globally, not stuff that is big in a region or big in a specific jurisdiction, but can be big globally. And we've got a nice discipline and trusted methodology of how we look for companies that have that possibility. The basketing is interesting because we find that oftentimes when individuals do get seldom access to deal flow, those deals require quite big uh, monetary contributions to be a part of. And in the simple capital uh, value proposition, we've negated that. So for small amounts of money, you're able to get involved. And then of course, that's the ticket size. The basketing side is where we aggregate more than one opportunity so that you're not exposed to the risk of one of these startups that goes bust but rather have a portfolio of assets that negate that risk. In the next conversation, or the next slide rather, I'll show you a little bit about our team, which has exponentially grown. The 
the world of COVID has certainly brought about a lot of change. Tim, if you go to the next one, we'll introduce some of the team members. And so if you do join our community through the QR code that we're going to show you, you're likely to engage some of these names and faces as the team that will help you through the process of getting involved. Um, we won't go through them tonight. Tonight is about actually the portfolio companies that we've had in the first round, just to give you an idea. And on the next slide, you'll see three names. You'll see Flex Club, Builder, and Noah. And in episode number one, we dealt with Flex Club. Episode number two, we had Builder. We do have recordings of those. And again, if you join the community through the QR code, you'll be able to access those historical recordings and, and get a feel for what those companies are all about. Tonight, we're going to introduce you to one of the founders of NOAA, and we're going to be having a little conversation with her, subsequent to which we get into a, um, a panel discussion. For that panel, on the next slide, we've got uh, some wonderful guests, and I feel honored tonight because I'm going to be the only male in amongst a female conversation, so I guess I'm the lucky one today. Um, and what I'll do, perhaps just to help with uh, building a bit of rapport and getting our audience closer to... Uh, meeting and, and feeling free to engage with our panelists, I'll ask the ladies to each do a, a quick one minute self introduction. And we'll start from the left. Um, Eleni, uh, very nice to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And uh, can I hand over to you for a, for a quick self introduction, please? Great to be here. Welcome to all of you watching. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Eleni Jokos. I'm a correspondent and anchor for CNN International. I host the show called Connecting Africa. That means that in normal times, I would be traveling across the continent, covering all sorts of stories and meeting CEOs, but I'm doing most of that virtually now. I was also at a time um, doing a lot of conferences across Africa and talking about the incredible growth stories, um, you know, that kind of drove the narrative um, in Africa. But things have changed and um, I've seen resilience and incredible endurance from a lot of the companies on the ground. Um, I filled in for Richard Quest in New York. I do a lot of things for CNN across the world. Um, my life has changed in the last year, I have to say, but um, it's been an incredible journey and um, really fantastic to be on this platform and share my thoughts. Lenny, thanks so much. We're privileged to have you tonight. I really look forward to delving into some of those exposures that you've had both virtually yeah. and in person and very interested to hear about how the world has changed pandemic wise. Can I just ask, where are you in the world tonight? I'm in Johannesburg. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. I've been so you're all the kids yeah. the cold. Yeah, it's been incredible just like not being able to move for a year now, which is, it's actually, there's pros and cons and we can get into that a little later. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us and welcome. And then as I move on to Caitlin uh, from Loud Hailer, uh, Caitlin, I'll ask you to also just make a quick self-introduction, please. Very nice to have you with us tonight and thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Willem. Hi, everyone who's listening. It's always amazing and a privilege to be on a, a power panel of women plus Willem. <laughs> <laughs> My background is um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Loud Hailer. I have worked with stakeholders across the full innovation value chain for close on a decade and really understanding how everyone from the garage startup to those preparing for investment or IPO interact with academia, research, reports, investors, media, uh, governments, uh, really how the whole ecosystem comes together. So been walking that road with a bunch of amazing people and mavericks and specialists for quite a few years. Uh, really, if I had to say, what will we talk about? We talk about how do we elevate the innovation story in Africa? That's what we do every day. We try to raise visibility on the phenomenal innovators and disruptors in Africa. We also look at how do we build partnerships, both, both locally, pan-African, as well as globally. So really exciting when we have startups like No bridging the fold both way, you know? So it's so having a product that is operating in, in multiple markets. That's incredibly exciting. Um, an exciting project on our desk is we've just um, launched the Global Startup Awards in all 55 member states of Africa. So I'm hoping that if anyone has a great startup here that you'll be making sure to enter yourselves because part of elevating the story is telling credible stories. So if you're a credible business doing incredible stuff, please, please join. And looking forward to hearing all about everyone in this panel. Thanks, Willem. Fantastic, Caitlin. There's so much content there for us to delve into. I actually fear that we might not have enough time tonight to get into all of that. 
the ecosystem play, Africa as an opportunity, not having all of the legacy infrastructure to amortize like some of the first world has, um, how Africa actually has this opportunity to do this quantum leaping. Uh, and of course, one of the things that we see in Simple Capital is the opportunity to play an arbitrage game between African startups and when their IP um, or solutions are moved into the first world. So really looking forward to the Q&A section, Caitlin, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Super, super to have you. As I then move over to Steph from NOAA. Uh, Steph, welcome. Nice to see you again. Thank uh, you. I know that you've chosen your background with care. I will ask you where you are because your background doesn't give it away. So I'm actually in my room in London, but um, uh, yeah, currently NOAA is operating out of London, although I'm originally from South Africa. Um, I'm Steph, the founder of NOAA. I started my career as a consultant at Bain & Company for about four years where I spent it doing projects in Africa and Europe and then eventually moved to the startup world because I was very keen to, you know, get my hands dirty. But I first wanted to learn from some great entrepreneurs before I did it myself. So I was fortunate to work with some of Europe's biggest angel investors for about two to three years. And then I really felt ready to take the plunge and start Noah, which is about democratizing storytelling through video. So really, um, I'm really passionate about helping everyone, no matter where they are, tell their stories through video, educate others. And I'm not talking about very short TikTok or Instagram style videos, but longer form content um, and content that is more on the professional side. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you more about it in a bit. Fantastic, Steph. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think you are only two hours, or is it now one hour time difference from us? One hour. Okay, so you must be you must be kicking yourself for the fact that you don't have a side uh, drink to enjoy exactly. as we go through this. Five I'm also steps. kicking myself that I sent you guys a slide which has me in the middle of it. <laughs> but <laughs> but anyway, let's ignore that. <laughs> Steph, let's get straight into it. Uh, firstly, just tell us quickly, what does Noah do? Um, you know, Noah from the Bible, uh, does that have any uh, correlation to the name of your business? Just help us, uh, yeah. for the people that haven't been a part of the Simple Capital community, just get a bit closer to what your business is and, and how it goes about it. Yeah, perfect. And, and just taking a step back, and I think I'll give a bigger picture of why we started Noah, because it's relevant for this topic today. But there were a number of few, there were a number of trends that my co-founder and I were very passionate about. The first um, was the rise of the passion economy, which many of you may be familiar with, or what's also deemed, I think, by A16Z as the enterprisation of the individual. So people actually were starting to become their own businesses. And this was a topic we were really interested in, and the whole creator economy. And this was driven by the fact that now people had you know, the relevant platforms that they could use and tools were being created to help people become their own businesses. And this isn't even only for individuals, but even for people within organizations starting to realize that their own personal brand was, was important. And so that, that's sort of one of the first key trends. The second was how powerful video was. So my co-founder spent about 10 years in video creation and we both saw how powerful it was as a medium to really connect with others. As soon as you started to see someone, you really got a gist of who they were. Um, you were bought into what they said or you weren't bought in, but if you were bought in, you could really start to build a connection with, with that person. Um, and then finally, obviously, as I mentioned, sort of this shift towards the way content was moving. So you used to have very big brands that would have famous people on screen and just talk about their products. And because of social media and these platforms like YouTube and Instagram, that's really changed to being a lot more about real authentic people telling stories that people want to hear. So shifting more from what are the problems my business is trying to solve and how do I add value and what's my product and that more selling into how do I create content that my audience can resonate with and actually learn from? So content that has purpose and meaning. Um, and so we were very passionate about this. And after speaking to many people, we realized that creating longer form educational video was way too hard. At the moment, there are two ways to do it. You either 
you know, figure out how to do it yourself. The average six minute YouTube video takes about seven hours to be produced. And this is because obviously you need to be good at script writing. You need to be good in front of the camera. You need to know how to edit. You need to know how to have a good background. Exactly. Have a good background and lighting, which is really difficult. Um, or you would go to an agent who would do it for you if you were lucky enough and spend about, I mean, in the UK, it's about £3,000. So the whole process was just completely unscalable. To actually create and build an audience, you had to be either spending hours and it'd be your full-time job or hundreds of thousands. So if you think about the likes of Gary Vaynerchuk, he has his own media team of like 20 people helping him create all this content. And so what Noah's really trying to do is enable people from all walks of life to tell their story um, with video all the way from coming up with ideas to supporting them in script writing um, their performance in front of the camera. How do they find the right setting and then making post-production easy so that with us at the moment we can make, someone can make a video in just 90 minutes. Obviously that declines the more videos you make. And yeah, the ambition is to really be a smart tool or, almost like a virtual director um, for someone in front of the camera. Um, so, so, yeah. so can I just ask there, so democratization in your world, does that mean mm -hmm. you're allowing more people to make videos or you're taking this complex production methodology and, and making it more accessible for people that don't have those budgets and those tools available? Or is it both? Or, or how do you view that? It's both. So the first is there was this massive barrier around video creation. Like I said, it was time, it was cost. And mm. there's something people don't really talk about, which is how overwhelming it is to get in front of the camera and actually speak to people. So like right now, for example, before this, we all had to psych ourselves up and, you know, feel confident. People are not, it's not a natural thing necessarily. And so there's something about making the process easy, but there's also something about creating a product that puts someone at ease so that they don't feel nervous and they feel like, okay, I'm being looked after. My, my first video doesn't have to be perfect. People care a lot about what they look like, sometimes more than what they're actually saying to their audience. And you touched on authenticity a little bit earlier. And I suppose what you're saying, or, or, or uh, what's, what's linking to what you're saying is that when you care so much about that veneer, perhaps you lose a little bit of your authenticity. And maybe you're doing it because you feel like the tools will let you down. And so democratization kind of sounds like it's going hand in hand with authenticity as well. Agreed. And I mean, there's two different streams of thought when you're making content and building a, a relationship with your audience. So some um, people who are more active in making content make a lot of video, um, almost to the point where the quality of their video isn't as good as it used to be, but they're more focused on getting awareness of what they're trying to say. But each video will sort of repeat itself. And then you get other creators where every video they make is important. So we are believers that quality is important. Um, and that's why by being involved in every step of the process, you create something that you could actually be proud of. And creating something you're proud of will incentivize you to create more good quality pieces of content. Mm -hmm. Last question for me just on this section is when you say longer form and shorter form, I understand that I'm not a subscriber, but my understanding is that TikTok is sort of a couple of seconds. YouTube is anything from a couple of seconds up to hours. Where does Noah play? So we play in sort of 30 seconds to 20 minutes, I would say. Um, our sweet spot's probably under five minutes. So content's moving towards being more shorter, but then you can combine it in a series. So if someone doesn't have time to watch a full 20 minutes, they can watch something at like, 10 minutes at 2x speed, for example. Um, right. You're seeing a little bit of aggregation with how content's made. So if you think about how you used to share content, on the people with massive followers on YouTube used to have very few on Instagram and vice versa. And the reason that was is these platforms um, have, the way you create content for YouTube is very different to the way you would create content for Instagram. For example, the one is portrait. The other one's horizontal. YouTube was typically for longer form. Instagram was typically much shorter, but you're actually starting to see a bit of a merge. So you're seeing that Instagram is now recogni recognizing the value of longer form. That's why they now have IGTV. And YouTube is recognizing um, the beauty of short form. And that's why they've now got their own short form video story um, platform. So you're seeing a shift that both can be beneficial and, and you're seeing a bit of a merger, whereas someone used to only create for one channel because it was too hard 
to share that or to strip away that content and make it like 10 seconds when it was a 20 minute video. But you're seeing all platforms starting to um, evolve and cater for both so that someone can have a following on both channels if they wish. Okay, so I mean, what you're talking about now is the is the fact that the platforms are are widening their scope of what they what they broadcast. But where is the tool to help the person make something quality? I mean, that's where Noah plays. That, are there yeah. are there competitors for you, or how populated is that segment of the market? They definitely are competitors, but most focus. So where we're very unique is helping all the way from the beginning. So the, we believe that if you write a great script and you perform well, you don't need to actually do much post-production. Whereas if you look at many competitors or video tools, they actually only focus on post-production. So you would mm. never um, necessarily record yourself on the actual platform. You would typically upload something, you would upload pictures and it would help you do post-production in a quicker fashion. It wouldn't help you with all the upfront steps required to, to make a great video. So I don't think they necessarily Kate, helped you get something of high quality. They just helps you get something that looked finished. The second thing is, Talking head, so we focus on talking head, is very um, specific. It's quite nuanced, and we believe it's growing. That's why that's why we're we're targeting that. Um, but it is a different. There's a different way to make a great talking head versus an animated video. Um, they require completely different skills. In talking head, you need to think about the lighting. You need to think about someone's background. You need to think about their use of hands. Um, what they wear. Are they wearing stripes that are distracting on the camera? There's so many. Um, small things that, uh, that that you wouldn't need in any other type of product. So who then uses this? I, so you say talking head. I think that's a bit of industry lingo. Um, mm -hmm. What is that? What, what is talking so, head? So and we, secondly, who yeah. uses this? So talking head is like you right now in front of the camera. So it's where there's a person at the center. Obviously, you can have a bit of animation. In terms of who uses it, um, it's used very widely. So some example use cases are obviously people are starting to realize that the people behind brands are more, once you build a connection with them, your stickiness to a product is um, becomes, you become more sticky to a product. So it's people behind the businesses that are creating these videos, showing actually who they are, what their stories are, showing how their products work showing their vulnerabilities. Um, it's people using talking head video for internal communication, for hiring. Hiring's a massive um, way that you can use. So like, for example, if you're hiring someone, you could actually make a video with the job description. The founders could make a video. So you immediately have a connection with that business. It's not like you're just looking at sort of a static piece of text on a PDF that someone sent you. So there's so many applications and it's typically where you would love to know the person behind what you're doing, like, and build a rapport with them. So the service industry. So for example, lawyers, um, lawyers making, we have a um, one client that makes educational content on the legal side. And as soon as you watch that, you're like, okay, these guys sound credible. I would love to work with them. They don't look cocky. He looks like a nice person. I, I resonate with um, Willem. I don't resonate with, I don't know, Tom. Let me, let me work with him. Right. So okay, almost that answers uh, your question. <laughs> yeah, it, to me, it sounds like uh, you, you're afforded the opportunity not only to punt your service, but to, be, to come across as the person selling that service. Um, and if you then found resonation that it's a much stronger connection, I'm wondering if Dwayne Johnson is listening to this conversation because I know he's big on Instagram. Dwayne, if you are out there, I trust you are. <laughs> I think you should definitely be looking at Noah. Uh, from a business side or corporate, it sounds to me, Steph, like this is something in vaccine rollout that an Adrian Gore should be looking at. Is, is that also a typical client for you? Um, it definitely could be. So we have some bigger clients that use us for internal communication. And again, showing authority and explaining processes telling someone why they believe like a vaccine rollout is powerful. For example, people, as soon as they have someone credible that they trust speaking about someone in front of the camera, again, it's a lot more powerful than like a tweet by someone, for example. Mm. And so you're seeing this as a marketing tool and an internal conversation uh, driver or, 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 or message broadcaster. 
Definitely. I would say the sweet spot's more for external. Um, we like to, marketing's evolving. So I think it's more about educational content, but educational content is sales and marketing. So they all kind of fall under the same bucket. But I would say most of our videos more on the marketing side. That said, internal communication, it's a great way for bigger corporates to um, scale how they speak to their staff for staff training. Um, another example in hiring, by the way, is I'm sure most managers, when you're interviewing, you interview 20 people in one go and you have to repeat yourself 10 times on who you are and what the business is. Like that could mm. have just been a video you shared before and you focus on the candidate. Right. And so, Steph, how is this business going? I mean, I, I hear the idea. I clearly see the passion and the expertise involved in building this product. How is your business coming along? So it's great. I mean, it's very early days. So we, we started in June and we're very fortunate to have Simple Capital fund us um, recently. At the moment, we're very focused on product building and acquiring clients and really learning from them. So at the moment, our clients get sort of a hybrid between a tech product and a service. Obviously, the, the vision is to make that just become a tech product. But this enables us to really learn with the client and they get something that's quite bespoke to them. Um, and yeah, it's been an amazing opportunity. I love just building. I love being my own boss. I, I love being involved in all the different areas and learning about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, what my co-founder is good at and what you know my team's good at, how to be a leader. So it's it's all around good very early um hopefully you mentioned in the beginning um we diversify our portfolio so if some are right offs it's all good uh, hopefully we're not the right off um but yeah really passionate about making this a great business and and actually helping people i think so i know people always say that but it really is our mission to help people become better storytellers so that's great um I, I'm going to circle back to some of the entrepreneurial lessons that you've learned um, because on the audience call, there, of course, are some entrepreneurs and we've actually found a lot of questions from audiences around uh, management of entrepreneurial ventures or learnings that can be shared. So in the Q&A style, I'm going to come back to that. In the meantime, I'm going to switch gears and go to Eleni and ask, Eleni, this democratization of storytelling has many, many pluses, the likes of which Steph has illuminated for us. But at the same time, I would imagine that one of the minuses that perhaps you may have encountered is fake news. Um, like, what's your views on that? So I, I'll touch on fake news, but I definitely want to speak to what Steph is doing as well. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on both. But, you know, it's been interesting. I remember sort of in the mid 2000s, we were, um, you know, talking about civilian journalism and how there was this incredible rise of, you know, civilians coming out with videos and, you know, covering the stories in their communities. And it was really kind of a revolutionary way of telling stories and then enter the, the kind of fake news scenarios where, it was difficult to verify videos. A lot of people started taking advantage of situations around them. And then, of course, the journalistic skills that we had learned at university or through, you know, working at broadcasters kind of didn't exist through this sort of democratization of the creation of, of new content um, and covering the things that you see. And you still experience this. So just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what CNN does. So every time we find a video online that says this is what's happening in the Gaza Strip or, you know, this is the experience on a street in New York City where you see violence or in South Africa, you know, in a street in Hillbrow, we go through this very strict process of verifying so we then have to find the person that has filmed this. We have to ask them certain questions and then we have to try and verify their experience through authorities. And if we can't verify what's happened, it is very difficult for us to cover this news because the risk then is that you could be covering something that someone has tried to, you know, exaggerate or playing into a political, you know, uh, kind of a political agenda, which has been happening more and more so, right? So you see, you know, Twitter bots and you see all these bots coming through that they kind of doctor videos or they just misrepresent the truth. 
So I think that it's like a double-edged sword um, with this. Um, and I think that it has its pros and cons. So for instance, if we can't get into a, you know, a war zone in the likes of Yemen and you have people reporting live um, through you know, an Instagram post or whatever, and they're telling you about their experience, you know, we we obviously will try and cover that as much as possible if you know if it's a personal experience. But if it's someone filming um, a an event, there are certain protocols that we have to take because we you know we have to make sure that we do things correctly. And facts for us always come first. And I think people think that you know, okay, great, this is the news we're covering on CNN, and it's like you know, as a true, and it's like literally we have teams called the row. And the row of people that triple check things. And then we have the standard and practices team. We have people that um, know the law. And they, you know, it's like, it's unbelievable. I literally will write a script, say on a business story in Africa. And I will get, if I don't have, if I haven't verified my information using three different sources, I will get a phone call going, where did you get that information? And it's, it's actually, it's also very hard sometimes because we constantly have to verify things. But it kind of gives you a sense of, when media companies or big organizations, it's not just CNN, it's, you know, the big multinational um, media organizations, you know, we have to trade very carefully when we see um, footage that has been brought up, that has been created by just, you know, someone on a social network. Um, if I may, can I comment on what Steph had said? Because I think it was really interesting listening to her product um, and what they're doing right now. Please go ahead. I, just, okay, I want cool. to interject. I don't want to bore you guys. So, no, so no, here's, no. So here's what I love about what Steph is doing. And this is how my life has changed, right? So to give you a glimpse, I, you know, I, I cover a lot of business in Africa. I travel, I, he, I I constantly headline these, you know, these big conferences across the continent. And at the same time, then I would interview the top CEOs when I was on the ground. So now I've got a problem. I can't go anywhere, but I still need to speak to these CEOs. And now they've got these really bad um, shots, right? They've got a bad background and bad lighting and it looks like a an S show, right? This is a safe space. I can say what I really know. Snowstorm. Feel. Snowstorm. Snowstorm, right? <laughs> so um, now we're asking them, can you set up a second camera? Can you get better lighting? Can you try and shoot on 4K on your phone 16 by 9? And now we're giving them, we're asking CEOs to become camera people, or we're asking their marketing team or their PAs to become camera people. And we sometimes, it's a great, it's sometimes we get it right. And the stuff that we get back is really good, but more often than not, it's, it looks horrendous. So we can't really use it on air. Now get this, we will always cover these CEOs, even if we just have a Zoom recording like we have right now, and we just have one shot of them and we'll have extra cameras on me, which will give us an opportunity to be able to intercut into the interview. But if they have a second camera or they have a good background, they've got good lighting and they have, you know, they understand the production value, like during this pandemic, it's brought to the fore that um, companies need to understand what we need. And when they're able to send us a second or third camera um, shot in the right, um, you know, in the right way, they will probably get more airtime because it looks good. Yeah, because TV is about looking good, right? It's about telling the story in the right way. So it's been an interesting kind of transition where we've seen companies taking the production value a lot more seriously, um, understanding that they need to get equipment, understanding that they, you know, for them to, to get more coverage, they need to think about um, how they look, because how they look is going to elevate how they, you know, in terms of their story and their messaging. And, you know, messaging is fantastic but if you've got a message that's in bad quality and someone's watching it on tv it dilutes Dilute the impact absolutely so that's why i think what steph is doing um is is truly phenomenal because it does a couple of things right so it helps corporates but i'm thinking as well that the producers that we work with on the ground and the you know we work with a lot of freelancers at cnn they don't have the right equipment it's expensive to get the right equipment. It's expensive to, you know, get these big kind of cameras that we're used to using in media. And if you can democratize, firstly, the, the, the kind of equipment, the infrastructure that you need, you can have help, firstly, the upcoming journalists, you can help freelancers, you can help production companies, and then you can obviously help corporates. 
Um, and that's what I think for me sounds incredible value for in terms of how I can feed into CNN or other companies telling their stories. If I'm listening to you, I'm hearing, Steph, uh, a major opportunity where Noah might have to put together a little prospectus for CNN to consider using to help impactful stories get delivered <laughs> globally. Yeah, obviously we would love that. Um, and I totally agree with what Eleni said. And it's not about looking perfect. But if you're like, have you guys ever try watch a video where someone's holding a camera and it's shaking and like, they're, they're lighting and they're completely overexposed or their face is in darkness and there's a window behind them. It is, we won't you use won't that. watch it. We won't, we don't even, we won't even use that on camera. Exactly. We will try and reshoot it. It will just not even make it to air. And you really don't look, need to look like a model, but you need to look like you spent time and people can actually focus on you. So like another yes. really minor thing is when someone wears the wrong clothes, it sounds weird and small, but like also like zigzags, you're just looking at their shirt the whole time, like not at what they're actually saying. Before I go to Caitlin, uh, Eleni, I just wanted to ask that fact-checking exercise, uh, I mean, the responsibility associated with telling the news and making sure that true stories are being broadcast, how does that balance against the relevance? Because it sounds to me like that process might take a bit of time and CNN obviously wants to be first in line to tell breaking stories. How do, you, how do you manage that balance? Just so, out of interest. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's a really great question. And um, here's the thing, facts come first. I mean, I'm not trying to like, you know, kind of throw the, the slogan uh, to you and, your, and, and the people that are listening. But the truth is that if we cannot verify something, we will rather wait until we can before we come out with that information. Because if there's a chance that it might not be truthful, the reputational damage is so enormous that it's not worth trying to take a bet on it. We don't take bets on the truth. It is, we, we do our checks and balances and we make sure that it's factual before we come out with it. So, I mean, I think that's the misconception, right? Because there's been so much negative sentiment towards CNN and we know that it has come through from sort of a political agenda. And, you know, it's been interesting to kind of watch it play out. Um, and then when I see what's happening internally, and I don't get a memo going, Eleni, you need to say this today, or you need to cover this in this way today. You know, and I think that that's the misconception is that I'm told what to say. In fact, journalists on the ground and the reporters and the correspondents, we do something called news gathering. We gather the news, we give, um, you know, we, we verify, we give our sources. Then there's another fact checking process and everyone's checking and checking and checking before we, we come out with it on air. So there's this huge process that goes on internally. Um, and then, and yet we've been vilified, you know, as mm -hmm. people that have been kind of pushing, you know, an alternative agenda that is against the masses, which has been kind of crazy to watch. Um, but, and I, I can reassure you that, that the kind of work that we do in the background has been incredible. And I also have to say this, and I keep on saying this because honestly, these conversations come up even when we were out at dinner with friends. You know, if it was, if we were being told what to say, or we were lying, I promise you there would be so many whistleblowers over the years that would have like completely burned us out of the water if this was true. And it's absolutely not. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like the last four years in particular might have been uh, slightly harder for CNN, given some of the political agendas that have been afloat. Yeah. We'll reserve that for commentary from our audience a little bit later. I want to, I want to switch to Caitlin and ask, you're involved in the, in the uh, scaling of this ecosystem and the, and the building thereof. Um, what do you find are some of the preclusive factors for, for startups and for entrepreneurial ventures to, to get that scaling and to play their role in the, in the ecosystem? Um, as a holistic player in this space, is Noah something that could, that could play a role in helping bridge some of those uh, mm. barriers or are there other barriers that we should be talking about as well? Well, Willem, that's like a webinar on its own. But, <laughs> but let's, let's focus on Noah for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I was intrigued when when you guys approached me and said, do you, got, do you want to have a look at Noah and give us your thoughts and be part of this conversation? So Stephanie, first of all, well done and well timed. Um, I think if you think about everything Eleni has just said here, yeah, the reality is part of what we do at the Loud Hailer is a publicity service. And 
when we are having to work with storytellers, journalists, and news outlets around the world, the companies that are able to put forward reasonable to high quality clips are the ones that are getting the airspace, right, mm. in general. So obviously, kind of checked with quality, fact checking, all of the like. But if, if, if I were to send Eleni something now, the first thing Eleni's going to look at is say, oh, this quality is terrible. Like, I don't care how good your story is. I can't work with it, you know? Mm. And then I'm going to scramble back and say, hey, company ABC, guys, we need something better than this. And then, and we're constantly stuck in that rut, right? So when it comes to, to barriers, Villain, that you were mentioning, I find whether we're working with an early stage two-person startup or a really big fund, or we're working with an established company that's maybe launching an innovation program or an empowerment program, I am constantly, constantly amazed at how little people invest in multimedia content in this day and age. And it absolutely blows my mind. But I think there's two problems there. I think there's one as a founder being very product orientated. So um, it's definitely not you guys, because it's actually your job. <laughs> your product is these amazing multimedia clips. But for the average business out there, I find that the, there's not a mentality of a multimedia conversation from the founder's desk right? And there's not an appreciation for the cost consequence. So mm -hmm. uh, it will blow my mind how much people will spend other elements of the business, which is important, but the total underinvestment in the communications portfolio, um, even if you just rack it up against finances, legal, and your other key pillars that are strategically important to the business, communications is a strategic asset. If you are not getting the assets you need within your communications portfolio, you are self-limiting your sales cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, I think investors themselves don't understand the value and the cost of quality of communications. Mm -hmm. So if you had to go and say, well, we're going to spend 100,000 this month or 10,000 this month or 15,000 this month, there's often so much pushback to that. And I think something that is really required within the space is that if you are a business owner or you're heading up your division, you have to get real with what communications is and what the cost is and what the effort is. So mm -hmm. my sense around Noah, where I think it's super exciting is obviously that we now live in this hybrid world of face-to-face -face and, and virtual reality. So if you're able to provide news out clips and, and your social channels with really high quality content, you, you're making the right strategic play right now. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing where I really get excited is what Noah is doing is solving a problem meaning that we can stop focusing on the problem and start deepening the quality of the conversation. And that is where I think there's this massive requirement for all of us is we can't say that video production or multimedia production is so expensive that we can only do it sporadically or ad hoc. How, how does that stimulate dialogue? How does it deepen a conversation? And a lot of what we're battling with in, in the African innovation space is that the conversation is unbelievably superficial. So mm -hmm. we're talking about who won an award, who launched a new product, and who, who, who raised what investment. And that's pretty much where the conversation stops. Now, really, what I hope to see between women and partners like Eleni, myself, and Stephanie over the years to come is to stop focusing on how we're making the message and distributing it, stop focusing on educating people on how to shape their message, but actually start being in public conversation spaces where our conversations advance and evolve. The reality is the whole world is looking at Africa right now. We are one of the final frontier markets in the world. We have so many challenges and opportunities that we should be attracting investors and disruptors from around the globe in an absolute tsunami wave. We're not going to get this right until they get the right message. And that's where this all plays in. So I think I'm excited about Noah because any tool that can be a more affordable mechanism for founders, business owners, visionaries to share their message, the better. And visual obviously being, being hyper impact. But I will say, when you get to that point to say, right, I've listened to these wonderful ladies, I get it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get off this call, I'm gonna call my people in, we're gonna put a multimedia strategy together and you're gonna phone Stephanie and get your quote. Um, but before someone like me can send it to Eleni, there is something I have to put out there which is you also have to know what you're going to say. Mm. So a smarter, better tool is only ever going to work for the people that have something useful to say. 
because at the same time we are inundated with content and yeah. what we're craving what we are all craving is high quality content tell me something i don't know but the space that i've worked in for a long time Bill, and with my team and with with these various entrepreneurs is there's a way to structure it so that you're not shooting in the dark there are ways to look at your business and segment out your content pillars so that they add strategic value to where you are in the life cycle of your product or your business. So in the same way, you would look at your customer journey and you would pinpoint where you need to have those various communication interactions, whether it's digital ads, whether it's your web page landing strategy, whether it's retargeting, you know, from a digital point of view, you could do the same with your, with your video strategy to have an integrated approach to how you're communicating with your stakeholders. Um, so yes, you would touch points. You would have certain product education uh, messages that you're sending out. Most people on this call are possibly repping a product or a program that is brand new, meaning you've got a whopping amount of consumer education to do to land your product in the market. And this is a way to have this always on access without putting operational strain mm -hmm. on having to build up bulky teams to, to do your customer service work. So, so customer service yeah. for me is a massive opportunity for, for a tool like Noah coming into the market. Um, but you would also be looking at like talent acquisition, um, showcasing your culture. You would also be looking at um, trying to break your own news. You know, maybe, maybe you can just break your own news. And, and I think something that is highly underrated is being able to, for, and Eleni, I don't want to speak on your behalf, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but for a journalist who wants to tell your story, they're not going to tell your story unless they believe in you and believe in what you're saying. And obviously, if you're if what you have to say is part of a relevant broader conversation. So sometimes clips where you are very articulate and well thought out and on message in time over volume consistently, that is not necessarily shared with the public, but shared with the journalists themselves to get a sense of who is this company and what exactly are they trying to do and why are they different? I think it speaks volumes than just sending out a press release because it can be really hard to get a sense of where someone is within that. And then Willem, just my, my last quick thing would be, um, I think you use video for different things. Um, and I think we are at the moment over the last year, particularly with lockdown, being exposed to intensified um, thought leadership, but in a very positive way. There's people we've never had access to before that are suddenly creeping out online and we get to listen to them and they're fascinating. And, and I myself, you know, I've had more access to C-suite executives during lockdowns than I've ever had in my whole life because people have time to have conversations and, and have taken time to use video chats, learn how to use it, right? So I would say particularly for those that are focusing on investment raising, um, you know, whether that's like a three, six months, 12 months, 24 month strategy, the reality is investors invest in founders and invest in solid, solid, solid products, obviously with, with scalability, right? But if you are wanting to showcase who you are as a founder, where your thinking is, your thought leadership videos could be very powerful on, on social media channels and no, it could be a very affordable way to structure that. So a lot of food for thought. And can I add one one sentence? I know I don't know if I'm allowed to because it's structured. You are definitely allowed to. Um, but just Caitlin, that totally resonated. And just one more one tip out of it, just for people who do want to make their own content, is you can forget to one thing that you constantly need to push yourself to do is say, "What does my audience want?" Like actually stop for a second of focusing on the obviously it should relate to your product and what you're building like if it doesn't it's not helping your business but like in the context of that what does your audience want to listen to do they want to listen to the problems your business solves no if they've heard it once they know it they probably want to learn something from you how do you help them in the journey like what are your top tips to do x how can they work with you without even working with you how do you build a relationship with them like six months before they're ready it's by helping them and and as soon as you change your mindset to how do I help people through my content and not how do I market myself and get millions of followers yes your or sales because that's usually the exactly. reality and, and people exactly. want to go on air and, and the first thing the, the journalists or the radio stations will say is I like what you guys are doing but how does this benefit my audience <laughs> yeah exactly and as soon as you change that mindset it also puts a bit less pressure on what you're creating 
and it makes you feel like you're helping people by creating this rather than it has to generate millions of sales. And obviously you should test it and see what works, but don't put so much pressure on pressure on it. Just focus on helping rather than um, sell by helping, I suppose. Yeah. Maybe. And, and if I could just say one thing, Stephanie, I thought it was interesting when you said, maybe I'm crazy to have started this business or you said something along that lines. I think seven years ago when I said, I'm going to start a communications agency that's going to focus on helping entrepreneurs and innovation, everyone thought I was mad. And seven years in, like we operate in multiple global markets. So I think you've come in at the right time and you just got to push forward because delivering something that is solving such a specific problem is, is hyper relevant. And yeah, good luck. I think it's great. And I think democratizing tools like this is much needed in many segments. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Uh, ladies, I feel like I'm not earning my money. This thing is just going by itself. Uh, Eleni, you've had your hand up. What happened uh, when you put, um, you know, incredible women all together, you know? Just up the talent quotient then you can sit back. Just telling you, you know, I'm just, you know, wondering what your role is here. No, I'm te teasing you. I'm teasing. Um, so, I mean, so much to comment on, really. And Caitlin, I, I mean, you know, you were talking about what it is um, that your mess what, what message you need to put out and how you put it out. And I've got actually so much to comment on, but I'm going to try and just be as, as succinct as possible. So firstly, on content creation, here's my other big problem. We don't have B-roll. We call it B-roll. We don't have footage of what companies do. So this company, for example, you know, a, a company I, come, I covered recently, it's called Cobra 360. It's an incredible kind of Uber for trucks. And we had to go and get footage um, of this company doing work. But now if these companies are doing, are creating their own footage and they're showing us what they're doing and they have that footage to share with us, that takes something out of our value chain in terms of things that we need to go shoot. If they know what their message is, it helps us. But I feel that there's always been a disconnect between what journalists are thinking about and what CEOs are saying. So CEOs are going, you know, our company's based on four pillars of blah, blah, blah. I promise you, if any CEO that's listening talks about four pillars in anything that they do in terms of content creation and, and, and messaging, you have absolutely failed. I will cut that out of the interview. I will absolutely not use it. What we care about is how do you differentiate yourself in the market? What are you actually doing? And don't hide away from your mistakes and your challenges. Own them and tell us how you're solving them. That is the kind of stuff that we will want to cover. And those are the questions that we were going to ask you. So the angles that you pick, the messaging is really important. I also find that CEOs and executives don't create personal messages. So sometimes personalizing things really does help. So talking about their story, talking about their journey and how they've come to where they are really is part of, 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 of the big message, right? So the one company was saying, look, I was trying to move goods from Ghana to Nigeria. It took me four days. It's the same distance that would take, you know, 12 hours in the United States. So I wanted to solve a problem. Now that personal story absolutely resonates. It resonates with the clients. It resonates with my audience and it resonates with me as a journalist. And I can use it as a starting point to start, you know, kind of asking questions. So I think executives need to move away from trying to sound too corporate or speaking to their shareholders about their four pillars of strategy or whatever you guys are doing in the boardrooms. Forget about boardroom speak. Speak to me as how you would be speaking to me over dinner. And yes, you can put in numbers and figures because that really matters, but you need to try and personalize things. And then of course, try and shore that up with incredible strong footage of what you're doing so we can see it. And then obviously having you know, um, a way to communicate with me other than a press release. So going to the, the story of sending me a press release, having a link to a video, and also having a link to B-roll that is accessible and easy to use with amazing drone shots of the big headquarters of wherever it may be. Chances are, if your story is relevant and it is solving a, a kind of a bigger, wider problem, you have you stand a big chance of being covered. If you get that media coverage, we know what that means. You get more exposure and it gives you credibility. And then of course, that also means that you can increase your client base on your sales, right? So that's kind of like, it's part of the value chain. Um, I find that companies sometimes, you know, are very reticent to share their stories or they're afraid. As soon as I get reticence, I feel that they've got something to hide and I'll be researching them a lot more. But if you play open cards with me and you share, you know, recent articles written about you or you share whatever information I could possibly get, 
you know, it helps, it helps me cover you easier. You know, I think that's about it. Sorry, I know we're running out of time. Sorry, I spoke yes. quite, quite and, and sorry, Willem, if I could just add there, because Eleni's spot on. What I have seen over the couple last couple of years, the startups, the businesses, the programs that have gotten a lot of exposure, weirdly enough, it's been um, entrepreneurs or startups that have done a partnership with a corporate at some stage, and the corporate has paid for the advert or has paid for amazing photos or has paid for that drone footage or has done some B-roll shots of how the product's been deployed. And basically, you know, you run, you run the hell out of that content, basically. But the difference is you always have it on hand. So a lot of the startups and entrepreneurs getting a lot of exposure, it's because they have that pack on hand. So, so when there is a gap and, and the news guys have got something to run and you've just got this beautiful footage, they, they just want it right so if you quickly, to- how do we find you right so you've got all these starters startups and entrepreneurs that are incredible around the continent i'm sitting in all i do all day is sit in google to try and find you guys i can't find you it's so hard and when i do there's nothing there's no content on you create your yes. content it is a massive problem eleni and this is there is this massive gap villain when you said what is the challenge visibility visibility I love that. It's such a nice segue um, into one of the things that we've seen as a fund or as an investment company. There's this golden ratio uh, called 110-1. 100 people talk about solving a problem. 10 actually attempt something and get active. One is successful. But the interesting thing is that of the nine that fail to leave you with the one that was successful, of that nine, seven fail for the same reason. And it's not team. It's not product. It's not funding. It's not corporate structure. It's actually having the ability to connect with a market to whom you, you know, not just sell, but whom you can expose yourself to, to build credibility and and brand awareness. I want to roll us out and and say um, what I'm picking up from this conversation is almost this pandemic acceleration of digitization, uh, bringing more content in digital format, much like tonight, to many more users and many, many more producers doing that but almost at the same time, a a correlated need for an increase in authenticity and truthfulness um, as this world gets saturated with with more digital content. I'll ask for closing comments from from each of you ladies and and we'll end with Steph, I'll start with Eleni. Um, And then while that's happening, perhaps we can also just quickly throw out that QR code again for audience members to join our community where more of what you're seeing tonight happens on a regular basis. And so Lenny, just in closing thoughts from you? You know, some of the most incredible stories have come to light for me uh, during this pandemic. Um, And it's been hard to find some of the companies um, and we've been able to guide them through the process of creating content. And, you know, some companies have actually gone out to shoot B-roll on our request. I mean, my, my advice to startups and to companies kind of wanting to make a mark is, Make yourself heard. Um, I think media coverage is really important. It doesn't necessarily mean you ha- you're in you know FMCG or you you know have something specifically for clients, um, you know consumers. But maybe you're you know sort of high level executives looking at you know doing B two B work, which is also fantastic. I think this extends just further than you know focusing on the consumer. I would advise that you have to absolutely get your messaging right, number one, and then focusing on your you know your multimedia infrastructure and getting as much footage as possible of what you are doing make it sexy make it look good and then just put it online um, and then you'll see requests coming through for media coverage fantastic eleni it sounds to me like there's a noah and often it both simple capital uh, portfolio companies combination that could help users do exactly that uh, caitlin any closing thoughts from your side Yes, um, I want to build on to what Lania said because she's spot on with those two points. I want to put a caution around the word authenticity. Mm. Please be very careful with your definition of authenticity. Authenticity is not making videos in your pajamas. Authenticity is not bearing <laughs> your soul to the world. Authenticity is not sharing your political views on what is happening with various situations around the world. Unless these things link directly to your business, unless you sell pajamas, unless you do therapy, unless you are deeply linked to the Israeli cycle right now. Um, So I think the element of personalization is important. 
What is that mm. connection point? Why are you the person solving this last mile delivery um, product or, or problem? Why, why you? Why this company? I think that's the story. Um, and the reason I caution that is you, you must still think about your consumer. You know, if you, for example, are working in a fintech product or having to, part of your scaling success is relying on mass purchases via digital interaction. That means that you have to build up that trust in a digital community without any face-to-face -face or, or very little customer contact. You still need to be able to give that sense of safety to your customer. So I just caution it because I've seen a lot of people doing these, these home selfies. And I, and I think there's a time and a place for that. I really do. But I think that's why when, when Eleni said, get your message right, that's pretty much the structure we work on first is who are you as a founder? What is your personal story? When is that appropriate to put out? What is, what is the product messaging? How do we put that out in a way that's accessible? You know, so I've just got some cautionary stuff around authenticity and mm -hmm. um, also from a risk point of work point of view, um, I've worked in crisis communications for many, many years. And to be honest, you can't put pig on a lipstick. If you do something wrong, it's going to come out. So, so crisis comes all about telling it fast, telling it all and telling it and telling it truthfully. So, yes. and, and managing that process as best as possible. So I caution authenticity because if you do it on a whim, because you think that's what being real is on the internet, that stuff can catch up with you. And you might be about to IPO your company one day and there's this really random clip that's on repeat because one day you just felt at one o'clock in the morning, it was your time to talk your truth to the community. So I'm being, I'm being a bit out there, but um, I think define authenticity for your company. Thanks. I love that. Uh, lessons for future CEOs and future IPO aspirants. Watch out for that echo of your digital footprint. As we head to Steph for closing comments, Steph, uh, any any uh, last parting thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, so I don't know how many are founders, but this is probably geared to the founders um, or even business owners. Um, one thing is in your specifically content creation, I think we, we spoke a lot about it, but I think it's important to get help from people when you don't know how to do something. I think as founders, you always think, oh, I'll figure it out, I'll just watch something. I found the biggest value add is me asking my network who the best person to speak to, yeah. speak to three of them, get the answer and then do it. Obviously at some point you need to make your own decision and have your own gut feeling and you should have an opinion on things. But I think um, Simple Capitals, I leverage them all the time for support. Um, and if anyone wants to find out anything about content creation, I mean, I'm happy to just have a chat also. So um, yeah, I think never, never work in isolation. It's like, 10 times faster to just leverage your community and people who are actually good at it to help you. Fantastic. Ladies, I'm going to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, sincerely, this was the easiest webinar for me to do ever. And I'm definitely going to ask all of you back. And certainly in our next series, where we're going to focus on entrepreneurial aid, help and lessons from others that have done it successfully. And for authenticity's sake, those that haven't so that we can learn from their mistakes. I'll ask for that last slide again, um, uh, Tim, and then I'll invite everyone, of course, to join the community where you get access to this type of content and also look out for our next raise uh, in Simple Capital Investco number two by uh, joining the community where you'll get access to this. Ladies, it's been a privilege. I've really enjoyed my time. I've made notes all around on this piece of paper from the stuff that I've learned out of tonight. We thank the audience as well for your time. We hope that the second glass of wine is ready and so will dinner be or that the mimosa went down well and you can now get into your work week. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Be safe out there and goodbye. <laughs>